welcome back to Brian's Things That Are Cool. Well, I wanted to do at least one episode this month that wasn't about Disney, so I figured we'd look at the Halloween episodes from Fox Kids. Fox Kids had an impressive 12-year run from September 8, 1990 to September 7, 2002. Initially, it was a three-hour block on Saturday mornings, which quickly expanded to a three-hour block Monday through Friday and a four-hour block on Saturday mornings. Like the Disney afternoon, Fox Kids brought you incredible worlds and memorable characters that felt like they were made just for you. I was even in the Fox Kids Club and was kept up to date with all the goings on with Fox Kids Magazine. Of its 12 year run, I watched Fox Kids for its first five years. A lot of the shows that shaped my childhood came from this period and are still counted among my favorite shows. As I've said before, I'm always drawn into the Halloween or horror themed episode of any series. And for Fox Kids, that's what we're looking at today. This is a spooky Fox Kids Halloween. We'll start our ghoulish trip off with Bobby's World. Bobby's World ran on Fox Kids from 1990 to 1998 and followed the daily life of Bobby Generic, whose overactive imagination causes him to misrepresent common sayings made by the adults, resulting in rather non-sequitur fantasy sequences. The character originated one day when comedian Howie Mandel choked on a piece of cake and could only let out a little funny voice while attempting to clear his airway. This was enough to base a character around for his stand-up act, and it proved to be so popular that soon Fox came calling. The episodes were based on stories from the childhoods of Howie and the writers, and all opened with a live-action slash cartoon segment with Howie and Bobby that watching it now was rather awkward. Hi! Welcome to Bobby's World, I'm Howie! Our Halloween episode came in Season 1, Episode 8, Night of the Living Pumpkin. Bobby can't go trick-or-treating because he's too little, so he helps Uncle Ted turn the house into a haunted house. There are a few cute moments here and there, like Bobby's sister unknowingly becoming part of the Haunted House tour, but the standout are three brief fantasy sequences with Bobby being chased by monsters, Bobby being served to monsters as dinner, and two aliens trick-or-treating as kids. The backgrounds in these sequences of graveyards and spooky castles just really gets that Halloween feel. Some of the characters' costumes are enjoyable as well, like Bobby's older brother Derek as the creature from the Black Lagoon, Howie is Humpty Dumpty, which is ironic because Howie played a live-action Humpty Dumpty in Disney's Mother Goose Rock and Rhyme. And then we have Uncle Ted as Elvis. I always love a good Elvis reference. The fantasy sequences tend to stop the show in its tracks, but it's made for little kids, and it's quite imaginative. There's plenty of Halloween elements to make for a fun seasonal watching, nothing too scary for kids, and some decent animation. A great start for a Fox Kids Halloween. Another show for a younger demographic featured a certain cat and mouse team who delight in horrific dismemberment. Except here they're kids. Tom and Jerry Kids. In keeping with the weird 80s and 90s trend of making shows about famous characters younger, like Flintstone Kids, a pup named Scooby-Doo, and Muppet Babies, Tom and Jerry Kids saw the popular duo as a kitten and a baby mouse, as well as other characters including Droopy, his son Dripple, and Spike and his son Tyke. The show ran for four seasons between 1990 and 1994 and was the second Tom and Jerry TV series made by Hanna-Barbera, with the first being the Tom and Jerry show in 1975. With only a vague memory of the show now, I was pleasantly surprised that it was a decent adaptation of these characters, and there's a lot to enjoy. While not directly Halloween related, we still got our thrills and chills in two episodes. Season 2, Episode 7, sees Droopy and Dripple visit the spooky mansion of Droopert, the deceased brother, to acquire an inheritance. But Droopert's sleazy lawyer Slick McWolf wants it and plans to scare the two out of the house so that the fortune can be his. The ghost of Droopert, however, is not going to let this out. This was my favorite of the two I watched. I was instantly reminded of a Porky Pig cartoon with a similar story called The Case of the Stuttering Pig from 1937. No direct mention of Halloween here, but the backgrounds and overall setting of an old rundown haunted mansion just screams Halloween. Droopy and Dripple are always funny, and the original voice of Fred from Scooby Doo, Frank Welker as Slick McWolf, makes for an enjoyable villain. We also get an appearance from another original Tex Avery creation, Miss Vivoon, who originally debuted as Red way back in 1943's Red Hot Riding Hood. Red was one of the biggest influences on Jessica Rabbit. 
Tom and Jerry would dip its toe or paw into Halloween themes once more in Season 3, Episode 9, with Doom Manor. Tom chases Jerry inside a nightmarish mansion in the forest called Doom Manor. It's there they meet a witch, voiced by June Foray, who truly loves cats, which is good for Tom, but decides to use Jerry for an experiment. June Foray had a legendary career as a voice actress and was no stranger to voicing a witch, including two separate characters named Witch Hazel, one for the 1952 Disney short Trick or Treat, and later the Looney Tunes Witch Hazel shorts. The gags in this episode almost feel like a Looney Tunes short, especially 1960's Hide and Go Tweet. There are plenty of classic elements here, a creepy old house, a scary butler, a witch, a laboratory, so there's a lot here to enjoy. If you like your Halloween mixed with some zany cartoon antics, these two episodes of Tom and Jerry may just be for you. Looking back on the cartoons of my childhood, I tend to think there were times when they just threw anything at the wall to see what stuck. Out of this plethora of strange ideas, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was given its very own Saturday morning cartoon show. In 1978, Four Square Productions released a parody of 1950s monster movies called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. It was dumb but a good kind of dumb, and was later parodied on an episode of Muppet Babies. The Muppet Babies episode was so popular, New World Pictures came to the creators and asked for a new tomato movie. Not even thinking they'd ever make a sequel, the creators came up with Return of the Killer Tomatoes, which was so successful, New World decided to turn the franchise into a Saturday morning cartoon. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes ran on Fox Kids for two seasons from September of 1990 to November of 1991. In Season 1, Episode 10, Spatula, the Prince of Dorkness, Halloween comes to San Zucchini as our narrator, Count Dracula, tells us of the time he gave Dr. Putrid T. Gangrene a serum to turn tomatoes into vampire tomatoes. Dr. Gangrene wants nothing to do with it and turns them down, but one of his tomatoes, Zoltan, overhears the conversation and thinks they said syrup instead of serum. Zoltan drinks the serum himself, becoming Spatula, the Prince of Dorkness. This gives Dr. Gangrene an idea to turn the whole town into vampires. And it's up to Chad, Tara, and FT to stop him. The show is made up of a who's who of well-known children's cartoon voice actors. But probably the coolest thing is that they got John Aston to reprise his role as Dr. Gangrene from the second film. With the fourth wall breaking, meta humor, and a heavy lean into the absurd, the Halloween episode, and the series as well, should be enjoyed by any lover of murderous produce. Taking a black and white horror comedy from 1960 and turning it into a successful stage musical, and then a film adaptation of the stage musical in 1986, seems like an odd idea, but it worked. Well, what if we took that beloved musical and made all of the main characters junior high kids, made the plant rap, and have animation that makes Gerald McBoing Boing look like Disney's Golden Age? You'd have Little Shop, which ran for 13 episodes on Fox Kids. The voice cast had several veterans of the craft, most notably Harvey Atkin, who's known to 90s kids as the voice of Koopa in the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, here playing Mr. Mushnick. The fright-filled episode 8, untitled Halloween Story, aired on October 26, 1991. Seymour, while scared of Halloween, goes trick-or-treating for the first time with Audrey. Outraged by the barbaric tradition of carving jack-o'-lanterns, Audrey II, or Junior as he's called on this show, decides to tag along with plans to steal all the pumpkins in town so he can give them a proper burial. Throughout the episode, there's an odd subplot of human Audrey who's Mr. Mushnick's daughter in this version, wanting to be a telephone operator. That kind of sums up the nonsensical nature of the show. It's not insane but enjoyable, like Ren and Stimpy. It's just a bit of a mess. The music segments can be a bit jarring, but every now and then, there's a catchy song, like the Bo Diddley-inspired number. The cheap animation and backgrounds can be creative, but they also can be rather busy. The Halloween elements of this episode are enjoyable, with a climax set in a foggy graveyard, and the pumpkins brought to life by Junior. If you're a fan of the film, or the musical, this is probably one to check out only out of morbid curiosity. It's weird, makes bizarre changes, the plant raps, 
God help me, he raps. It's Little Shop. With the new movie coming out this year, this one seemed timely, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice was produced for ABC and ran on both ABC and Fox Kids for four seasons between 1989 and 1991. It was one of the first animated shows to air on two networks at the same time. There are quite a few changes made in the show from the movie. The big one being is that now, Beetlejuice and Lydia are friends, and they have most of their adventures in the neither world, changed from the afterlife from the film. These changes open the door to all sorts of possibilities and creativity. Of 94 episodes, two were centered around Halloween. Season 1, Episode 8, Laugh of the Party, sees Lydia throwing a Halloween party to show up a snobby girl from school named Claire. Unfortunately, the only costume available to Lydia is an embarrassing bunny suit. She has no decorations, or food, and no guests. Prospects for a big blowout seem bleak. That is, until Beetlejuice, disguised as a party planner, Mr. Beetleman, convinces the Dietzes to hire him. As anyone could have guessed, this proves to be a bad plan, as the supplies he buys all come from the Netherworld, including odd decorations, food, and something called party people in a can. The can is opened, releasing the monsters meant to liven up the party, but as Lydia discovers by reading the warning label on the can, you should never open a can of party people on a full moon. The results are disastrous, and Lydia and Beetlejuice must rush to get the ghouls back in the can. Plenty of great Halloween imagery on display here, such as Beetlejuice's head turning into a jack-o'-lantern and the party guests in the can. Seeing the regular human characters in costumes is a treat as well. There's also a segment that shows up in other episodes as well of a Neither World TV pitchman that is done in early computer animation, which has a charm to it. We get a glimpse at the Neither World and its creatures, but this episode is primarily set in the human world. Halloween Fun returns to the Dietz household in Season 2, Episode 6, Bewitched, Bothered, and Beetlejuiced. Lydia decides to spend Halloween in the neither world. Unfortunately, her cat Percy decides to come along and gets taken by a witch on her way to the witch's ball. To get Percy back, Beetlejuice and Lydia must disguise themselves as witches and sneak into the party. The neither world setting makes this one stand out a little bit more, though it's not as crazy as other episodes set there. This is where the true creativity of the show comes from. If you like your humor with a touch of the macabre, just say his name three times. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Shut up. You fucking crazy? We don't want that guy running around in here. Next, let's see how they celebrate Halloween in Neverland. This is Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates was one of the more ambitious adaptations of J.M. Barrie's original tale and ran on Fox Kids from September of 1990 to September of 1991, with 65 episodes in all. Featuring a stellar voice cast, including Max Goof from a Goofy movie, Jason Marsden, Jimmy Neutron, Debbie Derryberry, and none other than Tim Curry as the villainous Captain Hook. The show expanded upon its source material, but still kept the feel of the original stories. Episode 25, All Hallows' Eve, brings us Halloween and Neverland, as Peter and the Lost Boys are out for a bit of mischief when Peter steals a pirate's lantern from a cave and accidentally releases the ghost of Jack O' Lantern. The ghost gets Smee to steal the lantern back from Peter and bring it to a volcano to be able to release all sorts of other supernatural beings to spread mayhem all over Neverland. Thus, Hook and the Pirates are forced to team up with Peter and the Lost Boys to stop the ghouls before Neverland is completely overtaken. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates is criminally underrated. I loved it as a kid, and it still holds up. This episode gives us the familiar imagery associated with Halloween, such as ghosts, skeletons, and witches, but goes a step further by giving us absolutely gorgeous, dark and macabre watercolor backgrounds of dark caves and pirate ships. The ghost having an Irish accent plays into Halloween's origins, and the series as a whole just has that swashbuckling adventure feel that I love. Unfortunately, in the States, there have only been a few episodes released on VHS back in 1992, but the series is available on YouTube. Go check it out. It's a truly phenomenal series with a spooky and atmospheric Halloween episode that's sure to hook you right away. Most kids' cartoons show stress the importance of helping people, but not Eek the Cat. With his catchphrase of, it never hurts to help, Eek, the eternally optimistic purple cat, is constantly punished for all of his good deeds. 
Coming from the strange mind of savage Steve Holland, the man who gave us Better Off Dead and One Crazy Summer, which both had segments featuring his talents as an animator, Eek the Cat ran on Fox Kids from 1992 to 1997. Holland based the show on his own cat, also named Eek. From the second season onward, the show was renamed Eek Stravaganza, and the Eek cartoon was paired with the Terrible Thunder Lizards, which featured frequent Savage Steve Holland collaborator Curtis Armstrong as a caveman named Scooter. Halloween is in full swing in Mictropolis. In Season 1, Episode 6, Hollow Eek, the bratty kids of Eek's owner are getting ready for Halloween and can't navigate their two-person giant chicken costume because they're too short to see out of the head. Eek steps in to help and promptly gets separated from his owners during trick-or-treating, ending up in a graveyard. While there, he runs into a ghost named Crypty, who's also been separated from his family and must find them before Halloween is over or he'll be forced to wander Earth as a lost soul. Eek's It Never Hurts to Help motto lands him into more trouble when he discovers that both the kids and Crippy's family have been taken by a witch. I had forgotten how great this show was. It doesn't have the violent nature of the animated segments of One Crazy Summer or Better Off Dead, but Holland still delivered something just as wacky with high quality animation. Witches, ghosts, costumes, and magic spells mixed with Eek's usual brand of insanity to give you a Halloween special you won't forget. There are a number of great mysteries in life. Why are we here? Where do we go when we die? Where on earth is Carmen Sandiego? Where on earth is Carmen Sandiego started life as a popular series of computer games before being adapted to a cartoon series that ran in Fox Kids Saturday morning lineup for four seasons between February of 1994 to January of 1999. Every script had to be approved by Carmen Sandiego's copyright owner who felt children's TV was too violent and didn't have enough educational content. This came on the heels of the FCC federally mandating such rules, which killed a lot of shows that I liked. Tales from the Crypt Keeper being a great example of this, as the second season dumped all of the fun horror elements in favor of lame morality plays. Thanks, FCC. That said, where on earth is Karma San Diego is at least done well, and surprisingly, did give us a Halloween episode. Season 4, Episode 2, Trick or Treat, opens with our Queen of Thieves, Carmen, being tricked by our main kid detectives, Zack and Ivy, during a heist in China, and she decides to get even with a Halloween trick. Carmen begins sending Halloween theme clues that were given the history of by Zack and Ivy's computerized, disembodied head that looks like Egon from Real Ghostbusters. All of the spooky items Carmen has been stealing lead Zack and Ivy to the conclusion that Carmen is planning the ultimate haunted house. But of course. As far as educational programs go, Where on Earth is Carmen San Diego did it well, just as its computer game had, but as a Halloween episode, it's rather lacking. It briefly touches on the holiday's Celtic origins, but doesn't really give kids much, and most of the episode plays like a typical cat and mouse heist story until the end when we get a costume party at a haunted house. While I think that the educational format could have been done better, we still get a stylish show with a cool villain that'll always have us asking where she is. Next up we have a show that'll truly send shivers up your spine and maybe give you goosebumps. Growing up in the 90s there are so many great anthology shows that I watch and some that I shouldn't have been watching. Are You Afraid of the Dark, Tales from the Crypt, Perversions of Science, and then of course Fox Kids had Goosebumps. The series was based on stories from Arl Stein's book series of the same name that topped out at 240 books in all. Plenty of material to work with for television, even if the book series was 15th on the challenge books list due to the frightening storylines and depictions of the occult or demonic themes. Stein himself has said that one of his biggest influences was the Tales from the Crypt comics from the 1950s. The book series was adapted to TV and came to Fox Kids in 1995, where it ran for four seasons and had three very memorable Halloween episodes. The Haunted Mask was the premiere episode and aired on October 27th, 1995. I still remember what a big deal Fox Kids made about it. This was THE Halloween event of 1995. Preteen Carly Beth is constantly made fun of and falls for every prank played on her. 
She's had enough, and with Halloween coming, she decides to check out the new costume shop to find the scariest mask she can to get revenge on her tormentors. When she comes across several hideously deformed masks, she convinces the reluctant store owner to sell her one. At first, she's excited to get her revenge, but soon realizes the mask not only won't come off, but has become part of her skin. When Stein was writing the original book, he got the idea when his son had trouble getting his Halloween mask off one year. Like Zebo the Clown or the Ghastly Grinner from Are You Afraid of the Dark, the Haunted Mask became such an iconic villain for the Goosebumps series, it got three sequels, though only The Haunted Mask 2 was adapted for the TV series. Haunted Mask 2 aired the following year on October 29, 1996, when Steve, one of Carly Beth's bullies from the first episode, decides against going as a pirate this year, he finds another one of the Haunted Masks from the costume shop. A decaying old man with spiders in his hair. Like Carly Beth the year before, his choice in masks proved to be a very poor decision. Most of the cast came back to reprise their role from the first, except for Steve himself, who's been replaced by John White, who appeared in another episode of Goosebumps as well, and on an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Both parts are great watch, and some of the best episodes the series has to offer. For child acting, it's good acting, it has impressive effects for a 30-year-old kids show, and a creepy atmosphere, and a villain that can be a little bit scary for younger kids, but still a lot of fun. Season 2 saw another Halloween episode, Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns, which aired on October 26, 1996. On Halloween, Drew's friends Shane and Shanna pay a visit and offer to help her scare two of her bullies. I guess there's a lot of bullies in this world. This is one of several episodes with a twist ending which I think Stein would perfect in his later series, The Haunting Hour. I won't give anything away because there's no fun in that. All three episodes in the series as a whole were shot in Ontario, Canada, and made several changes from the original stories, such as toning down some of the horror elements to appeal to a wider demographic. At times I think they did this too much, but these three Halloween episodes still hold up well. Viewer beware, you're in for a scare. After Goosebumps came out in 1995, Fox Kids would go on for another six or seven years, but for the most part, I had stopped tuning in. As a teenager, I wasn't watching Young Hercules, Digiman, Beast Wars, or Angel Anaconda, because they were past my time. There were shows from my time watching Fox Kids that, for whatever reason, I never tuned in for. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers had two Halloween episodes, Life's a Masquerade, and Trick or Treating, but without much of a personal connection to them, I wouldn't really be able to give a fair review, especially given its devoted following, even decades later. Shows like The Tick, Batman the Animated Series, Tasmania, Super Dave, X-Men, and Spider-Man were all favorites of mine growing up, but none of them had a Halloween episode. My biggest omission here is clearly the shows produced by Steven Spielberg. I absolutely loved both Animaniacs and Tiny Toons, and they both had Halloween episodes. Multiple, in fact. Their Halloween specials are so good, and there's so much to talk about, I'd really like to save them for next Halloween, where I can give them the time they deserve. Big surprises, fresh new faces, now you know the cool places. Everybody knows. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed a spooky Fox Kids Halloween. If you'd like to be kept up to date as to when I release a new video, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And if you really want to be notified, hit that bell as well. I'm Brian, and have a happy Halloween.